Hey Beer Geeks, welcome to the Craft Beer Channel and welcome to another edition of our Trappist Special. Today we are driving through the cyclist-strewn, hop-strewn, uh, windy lanes of West Flanders on our way to what some consider the greatest brewery on earth, and that is West Valletta and Brewery of the St Sixtus Abbey. We're going to be headed to their cafe and picking up some beer to take back to the studio to appraise and go through the history of it, but we thought we couldn't pass up the opportunity to actually visit this place and maybe pick up some beer for a very special occasion that happened not long ago. Welcome to a new series that digs into the incredible beers and stories of the Trappist breweries. These are beers made within the walls of a Trappist monastery by or under the supervision of monks and purely for the upkeep of the monks' way of life or good causes. Despite that, or maybe because of that, they have had a huge impact on how and what we drink today. Some of the best beers in the world come from Trappist breweries, but not a huge amount is known about them due to the limited access lay people have to them and a little bit of that classic Belgian brewing mysticism. We hope one day to visit as many as will let us in, but for now, we're going to be taking you through them one by one to give you the history, the impact, and of course the flavours that they have given the world, all from our own place of worship, the Brudio. Your destination will be the right. Uh, So we're not in the Brudio this week. No. We are down at the Beer Merchants Tap, which has pretty much the best selection of Belgian beer in the UK. I'm saying it categorically, I oh, reckon it, it's the best. It does. In the fridges, amazing. Yeah, it is incredible. But yeah. what they don't have are these three things, which you can only really get from the brewery. You can get a little bit in, uh, in the Netherlands now because the grey market was so prevalent there, they were just like, okay, just have some. <laughs> um, so yeah, we had to go pick it up and it was a very exciting trip, wasn't it? It was. I think it, for me, it was one of the highlights of last year. Never you been- You talking about the ice cream we had though, right? Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> come on, like Westy ice cream, uh, Sunday. It was a Sunday, no less, it was massive, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It was genuinely an incredible beer experience. Yeah, I mean, it is a weird experience. I'm gonna get the first beer in the glass yeah. before we talk about this because it is essentially a pensioner's cafe. Yeah, it did feel like a bit like <laughs> everyone was waiting to die a little bit in there. But what a place, Johnny. What a place to die. To die. Yeah. It was a, a truly a spiritual place in every kind of respect. In every it? respect, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, if you don't know, you can't really go into West Valletta and you can't really go into any of the, the, the Trappist Abbeys, but a lot of them have a cafe that they use to sell the beers. Um, and West Valletterans and West Malers are basically basically a refectory for the, the local pensioners. So you go there, you have a croque monsieur and you have three of the rarest beers on the planet. And I would argue, well, yeah, three of the best Belgian beers yeah. made. And I, I just want to say it was a really great experience. The staff were like really fun yeah. and nice. We caught one guy on his last day. I yeah, don't know did. if that was why it was so fun. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, was, it was really good. Yeah, it was, it was, we had a wonderful lunch, a wonderful time, and we walked up the abbey, down the sides of the yeah. abbey. There is a little uh, chapel you can go into, pay your respects, and then you can go round the walls to the Lord's Grot. Yeah, that was is, wild. Yeah, like it's basically a shrine to Mary. Very weird place, yeah, but... Like a forest grotto yeah. sort of thing with loads of friezes of different things carved in them, religious-y yeah. sort of stuff. A nice place to sort of Contemplation. Walk, walk, I was going to say walk off the Westy 12 that I had. Oh, yeah. And indeed the Westy 12 a ice nice cream. place to stumble upon when you're yeah, drunk. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, so what we've got in the glass now is West Valletta and Blonde. Yeah, it's definitely Blonde. A 5.8, probably the, the strongest of like the light blondes at 5.8%. I think this beer is absolutely brilliant. I love it. It smells a lot smells like... Great. It's like a session West Mala triple, and it is the West Mala yeast, so that might be why. Ah. But banana, brioche, very little hint of clove, a little bit of banana and um, uh, pear. A little bit of zinginess, yeah. yeah like a little, a little and a little bit of lemony zinginess. citrusiness. Just a gorgeous smelling beer. 
And it's bright and light and zippy. A little bit creamy, foamy, champagne-y yeah. kind of feel to it. Yeah, it's got a really light, summery, mm. like, you know, I'm having an OAP day out and I'm going to have a little dance around the grosso kind yeah. of vibe. It's your classic, your classic OAP, <laughs> croque monsieur and blonde combination. <laughs> uh, but nobody really talks about this beer, but I think it's a brilliant blonde. It's really good, isn't it? I mean, it's nothing like Allagash White, but it's got a sort of kind of uh, meringue kind yeah. of slight meringueiness to it. It's got that texture as which well. Which I quite like. I'm a textual guy you sometimes are. with beer. You're tactile. So I, I make strange brain connections and that to me is it's bringing a little bit of that somehow. A little bit of wet meringue. Mm. Um, and yeah, nobody really talks about this beer, but it is delicious. And I mean, all three of these beers are delicious, but I just, nobody goes to West Valletta to try the blonde, but you should. Yeah. I mean, you should have all three when you sit down with your crock. But I think this is a really, really lovely beer. And the kind of beer that if I live near West Valletta, Session. If I was going to the cafe, that's probably yeah. what I drink. It's great. Mostly. Cycle there. Oh, yeah. Have a nice little cycle on that. It's flat, almost a lovely... Rattler. Oh, it's great. As far as, as far as the Belgians are concerned, yes. it's a Rattler. That's a beautiful beer. Yeah. And that, I think that's testament to how interesting, how kind of world shattering these beers are, that that's a great beer yeah. and no one's talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked a bit about our history with West Valletta and our little trip there. And now we're going to talk about the history of St. Sixtus Abbey, really, we should say. So West Valletta is the brewery of St. Sixtus. Um, and it's actually one of the longest and most complicated of the Trappist histories. It starts in 1260. 1260, when a group of nuns moved to that, I presume, pretty wooded area. Yeah. And they build a church. Wow. And they lived there for about 50 years. Um, and then they sell it off to an abbey up on the coast of Belgium who use it as a wood store. Use that church as a, as a, a bit, wood store. A bit disrespectful. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of surprised that's that an abbey wood. would be like, oh, that's a nice church. We'll just, we'll just, just fill just it with timber. Store wood in that one. Fill it with timber. But that is the humble origins of St. Sister's Abbey. But it's got a couple of twists and turns, which will probably require a beer while we talk through. I mean, it'd be rude not to, wouldn't it, Johnny, <laughs> at this point? So this is the eight. Yes. Which is my favourite West Valletta and beer. Yes. Of the three, I don't care what the internet <laughs> says, the eight is the best one. So we've had, a, we've had a green lid, we're now on to a blue lid. Blue lid. So it's not quite a traffic light sort of system <laughs> they've employed. Not really, although they do have one to pick up the beer, as we learned. They certainly do. Yeah. They um, certainly do. So this is their dark kind of double style beer. A bit, maybe a little bit darker than most doubles, a little bit closer to a sort of Belgian stout. Yeah, that is very dark, isn't it? Very ruby. And there's more banana, loads of kind of raisiny, sweet, dark datiness. It's very rich, Johnny. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So little hints of pear and nail polish, but also bitterness, like roasted bitterness, not hot bitterness. Or maybe a little bit of hot bitterness. A definite kind of assertive, slightly roasted, slightly hoppy finish to it that you wouldn't get, say, in West Mal Double which has the same use, similar ingredients, but none of that big finish on it. It's a really, it's a really complex beer, isn't it, Joey? Yeah. I imagine it would just, it's, it, it's quite cold at the moment, but I imagine it would open up as it kind of warms up. Yeah, absolutely, which, which it will do while I tell you yes. uh, the history. Was that that long um, history, is it? I should just know, it is, it is 8%. <laughs> yeah, it's 8%. <laughs> so, buckle in. Oh. So, as I was saying, it's a wood store. They're just storing wood in there. Glorified wood until, store. Until 1610. That's a long it's time. It's a long time to Jesus. store your wood. Uh, but then some hermits move in. They go, well, this isn't really being used very well. Hermits, eh? Hermits. Like religious hermits. The origin of the oh, word hermitage, hermit is like they were yes. religious. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so, okay. so they look at this, this wood store slash church and go, you know what, that, that's probably quite nice to, to start up a monastery. They saw the potential. They saw the potential in the place. Exactly. Um, so they move in and actually they live there for over 100 years and build a proper monastic community of about 90, 90 monks live there over the next sort of 120, 130 years. Wow. Um, and it essentially works as an abbey and it grows and it grows. And even, even at that point, we know from the plans of this monastery as it was expanded, that there were sheds, one of which was a brewery. Okay. So we know that somewhere around the 1600s to 1700s, a brewery's installed yeah. on the site of West Valletta. And, well, a little way away, about 80 meters away, uh, where they were brewing beer for the first time. Probably like a really light table beer, nothing like this stuff. But then, I mean, it's not the Reformation, we're in Europe, but a similar thing did happen in Europe a little bit after the Reformation. And the monasteries 
that were not seen as uh, they were seen as contemplative. So they weren't educating, uh, healing the sick, anything like that. They yes. were studying and just being the cliche of a monk. Lots of them got closed down. So they, by they the were, pope. They, the pope was like, no, sorry, know, the Holy Roman Emperor, not the pope. Right. You're not really thing? helping uh, your community. You're just yeah. it's insular thing. They're not outward looking monks. Because they weren't useful to the world, they were seen as not beautiful to God or oh to the Holy Roman Emperor at the time. Poor hermit monks. Yeah. So then the, the, hermits, uh, the hermits are chucked out and the monastery goes to ruins slowly. And you can still see the ruins nearish to, uh, to the abbey. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the end of West Valeteran's original, sorry, St. Sixtus's original site. Yes. And there's a bit of a gap. And then we get close. To welcoming these fellas. So about 30 years later, a man called Johannes Baptista Victor, another hermit. With a name like that. Another, he wow. can do what he wants. He's a fancy hermit. <laughs> <laughs> so he moves into the area. Actually, I think it's his son-in-law has somehow come to own the land and he moves on to this land and goes, I'm going to see out my days here, praying, working, and he has this kind of loose ambition of starting a monastery again, or maybe a school. He wants to do good. He wants, yeah. he wants a legacy for his last sort of, the last time he has on earth. He wants to leave a mark. Nice. Unfortunately, yeah. he dies before he's able to do either of those things. But he does get to shake the hand and welcome some monks who did found the monastery. And those monks will tie in with our video with St. Bernardus. So they are monks who fled from a monastery in France because this sounds like the start of a joke. But basically, the, the abbot, the prior, fell out with a bishop. <laughs> and he so fled. This prior and this bishop walked into a pub. Yeah, it's exactly. Well, I don't think they did. Okay. I, I, they I, fell out big yeah, time. Yeah, they fell out big time and they fled. Wow. There okay. also might have been some tax reasons. That's what yeah, we also yeah. heard from. Um, yeah, tax evading from monks. Bernardus. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we heard. So, only anyway, they moved to this area. We're not quite sure how they found out that there was pot the potential for a monastery here. But they yeah. must have, somebody must have gone like, oh, this, this Victor bloke. Divine intervention, Johnny, could obviously. Be that. Could be that. Um, so they move into the area um, like a year before Mr. Victor dies. And he welcomes them with open arms. He's like, sweet, this is exactly what I wanted to happen. It's happening. Praise be. Yeah. And they found the monastery that soon becomes known as St. Sixtus. Nice. So there's not much there. Victor hasn't got far. He was an old man. He wasn't going to do the building himself. So the yeah. monks then have to start building this monastery. The thing is, they, they don't have any money. Uh, they fled the country that they were in, so there's not much support coming from there. So they do a couple of things. First thing is they start a farm and they start selling eggs, butter, stuff like that. Uh, they also get in contact with West Maller, uh, an abbey way up in northern Belgium, and they help them out as well with a grant. Um, and actually, uh, they send down two monks to help, uh, one of whom becomes uh, the, the pre or the, the abbot um, because the... The original monk that came, the lead monk, he's, he's, he's gone as well. La Long and Langendonk. Oh, poor he's, Langendonk. Yeah. Didn't see uh, Did, into fruition, eh? No, he did not either. So West Mile are helping out, and then lay people are also donating, because back then it would have been a great honour to have, you know, monasteries and, and such in your, well, in your back garden, but nearby. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the other thing that they have to do, so they're building this monastery, and it's tradition that um, lay people will, will help out uh, for pay, but also for beer. So it's tradition that the monks would provide beer to these people. So initially, the St. Sixtus monks were buying in the beer. This was very costly. So they went, oh, why don't we brew it ourselves? So this is when we get what we can trace all the way back to being like a West Valeteran brewery. So they buy a very small brew kit. They start making essentially table beer for the laymen that are building the monastery for them. Nice. Um, and we, yeah, we don't know exactly what those beers would have been. They wouldn't have been these, but they would have been brewed um, and eventually sold about 50 years later to the general public. Uh, they upgraded the brewery about 50 years later to make bigger, stronger beer and sell it mm. to keep raising money. Uh, but still, the farm was the biggest, uh, biggest income for them for a very long time, pushing, you know, pushing a century after the, the brewery was built. Who would have thought monks were such a good businessman, Johnny? Uh, yeah, I mean, they have built a monastery from the ground up with... I guess, I guess a lot of donations, but not a lot of help, really. They must have had to have a, a level head on their shoulders for yeah. finances. And, you know, as the Trappists do, they have to have this balance between manual work and prayer. And clearly they did that to build a monastery and build a brewery and man a farm. 
and build it to the point where the brewery actually became one of the biggest incomes and became such an important part of the monastery that just after the Second World War, West Valletta and, well, sorry, St. Sixtus managed to essentially escape the war. In World War I, the Germans never got that far, and in World War II, nothing was nicked or anything like that. So they come out of World War II in a pretty strong state compared to most Trappist breweries, or any breweries, really, uh, yeah. on the mainland. But unfortunately, the, the, the leader of the monastery at the time uh, the abbot, he thought that the brewery had become a distraction. He thought that it was bringing the monks too close to the lay people. Yes, that it I was that. it was disturbing them from their work, yeah. uh, sorry, from their prayer, and yeah. it was too much. So what he decided to do was to essentially close the brewery, or rather, what he did was he said, "We're only going to brew beer for ourselves," but they still needed some income. Mm. So he went, and we will know this from the St Bernardus video, to a local cheesemaker who apparently he used to play cards with. So we've got gambling, uh, yeah, to add to the list. I, I like that he, things, he was the one telling them that the brewing was distracting. Yeah, too, too distracting. He's off playing cards. He's like, I need to practice more cards, lads, with I'm the losing. cheesemaker. <laughs> so he goes to this cheesemaker and says, look, you can brew our beer under license and we'll take a bit of profit and you can take the rest uh, and, and that will help keep our monastery alive while not distracting the monks. So this is the famous contract that's drawn up between St. Bernardus and St. Sixtus, where St. Bernardus brew the West Letter and beers. Now, we, we're fairly sure at this point that this beer is now being brewed, the 12, which we'll taste in a minute. So that contract lasts for nearly 50 years. Wow. Uh, early 90s, uh, the Trappist order, I guess they're kind of sick of people taking advantage of their good name, calling things Abbey beers, Trappist beers, all this stuff, which would have appealed to religious people and indeed to beer geeks. Yeah. Because some of these beers are starting to get a good reputation. Um, so they decide that if you want to call it a Trappist product, you have to meet certain criteria, yes. which includes making it on the premises. So suddenly, those beers made at St. Bernardus are no longer Trappist beers. So the West Western monks take the decision to bring production back in-house. Now, this creates this split where we have the St. Bernardus beers, which are actually possibly closer to the originals. Um, and we then get the beer coming back to West Valletta. And so now we're where we are today. So they're almost starting from scratch. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, they'd have had the recipes, which they yeah. had the rights to, but, you know, the brewery would have... Uh, I think the brewery was upgraded just beforehand, possibly with one eye on the fact that they were going to have to do this. And it, it left St Bernardus in a bit of a quandary, didn't it? They'd lost their status. Lost their status, lost their sales as well, lost their marketing. Um, so that was really tough times for them, but we've told that story. Sure what we need to tell is the story of West Valletta, because when it all gets a little bit out of hand, about a decade later, a certain beer is voted on rape beer, the best beer in the world. And suddenly the monks, <laughs> suddenly the monks are getting a couple of phone calls to order the beer. Should we try the 12? Let's do it, buddy. So it's 2005, Bradley. What were you doing in 2005? Oh, I was a wee whippersnapper at that point, Johnny. Were you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just, probably... I just got my A-levels, I think. Oh, 2005. I would have been at art school, right. probably. Drinking Brooklyn Lager. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, you were on the train already, were yeah, you? Yeah, wearing my Winkle Pickers, <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. And listening to new rave music, probably. Okay. Do you want to know what the West Valletta monks were doing? Much the same as me, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> In their Winkle Pickers, I yeah. doubt it. So, no, the monks of West Valletta were answering 100,000 calls a day. Are you paraphrasing that? Nope. Okay. <laughs> 100,000 calls a day wow. from people looking to buy West Valletta and 12 after it was voted the best beer on rape beer. Important to note, the amount of votes that it received was about 150. Oh, so, so they were just like perfect scores. The tiniest little subset of beer geeks that yeah, changed yeah, yeah. the world, essentially, the world of beer, because they voted it the best in the world. That got so much press attention. Yeah. That they had, they had 100,000 people calling. Well, initially, before they got the calls, they had people turning up in cars trying to buy the beer. It caused chaos. The, tra the police had to be called, traffic police, yeah. to organise the queues and to deal with the damage that was being done. Wow. So the monks installed the phone line. They got 100,000 calls for about 60 pickup slots a day. That then sent the local telephone network into meltdown. So the government had to intervene and give the West Valletta monks a national hotline so that it wasn't going through the local channels. National Monk Hotline. <laughs> so uh, that sort of helped to 
settle things down a little bit. But now, when we went, it's now, it's actually like buying tickets to, I don't know, Taylor Swift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they open the ticket sales for a couple of hours and it's gone in 10 minutes, which is what we did when we ordered a case of this for our festival. And you have to go pick it up. You have to be in a car. Um, and there's a traffic light system that we drove around and we picked up our beer with a very surly man. An actual traffic light system as well. An we're not, yeah. We're not talking about like air quotes traffic lights. They've no, got actual literal traffic lights. lights that take you around a field, yeah. essentially. And then like you said, very surly man. There's no filming there, Johnny. No they don't filming. let you film it. No filming. None of that. Sorry, we filmed a bit. We did film a little bit, maybe. Yeah. Did we? No, we didn't. We want to go back. I'm, I'm presuming I'm putting the B-roll across right okay. now. <laughs> we want to go back though, Johnny. Someone else surreptitiously filmed that. Yeah, 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 someone else, definitely. Um, but what most people were looking for was this beer. So this is the beer that was voted best beer in the world. Yeah. Um, it is a 10, what is it, 10 6? 10 2, 10.2%. So this Belgian is the 12? Cold. This is the 12. Wow. And this is one that I've aged. So on the cap, 28th of September, 2020. Pandemic that time. Is, that is pandemic time. Um, so this has no label on it. The, the monks were told that according so to European law, you have smoky, to put... Smoky, Johnny. Yeah, lots Still of, going. Lots of carbonation on the, on the, uh, on the opening. Um, so yeah, the monks were told that they had to put a label on it, but this one precedes that... Uh, that They're outlaw monks against European uh, legislation. <laughs> I was going to say precedes the nanny state EU. Thank God we're out of that. Oh, God. Oh, God. Uh, right. <laughs> So this is the 12th, supposedly one of the best beers in the world. Let's, let's just take a moment, shall we? You can smell the age on it. I thought we were going to do a, like, a, a, like a choral. Oh, we can add that in moment. post. OK. Yeah. Um, yeah, sherry and oak kind of character. You can get oak from certain yeasts. It's definitely coming out. And then red berries. It's, yeah, it's very berry to me. Figgy, very, very figgy. And a little bit of kind of licorice. Mmm. Wow, so it's, it's complex, it's boozy, it's sherry-like, it's all the dark fruits you could care to mention. A little bit kind of tangy, so less rose character than this one but a kind of bitterness and a dryness on the end as well. It's got a lot of complexity, hasn't it? Yeah. It's doing all kinds of things in my mouth, Johnny. It's hitting all the different zones. I, I don't know about you, but for, like, for these two, the West Mali East really sings, and you can tell it's got West Mali East in. This one has none of that character of the West Mali mm. East. It's been pushed further than West Mali East usually does. It's then been aged. And I think, you know, lots of sugar's gone into this to make sure that it's bright and dry. Adding sugar means you can get higher ABV without adding kind of thickness and maltiness. Yeah. So it's got a nice dry, lighter body to it, even lighter maybe than this one. And oh, aging sorry. will do that as well. But it's, yeah, super complex, isn't it? I love it. It's got a really lovely, sort of soft, caramelly, oaky thing going yeah. on, which is super nice. It actually reminds me a little bit of the ice cream. You can see why they put it with vanilla ice cream, can't you? Just yeah. a splash of vanilla in that. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely it, stunning. It would bring out the sort of the vanilla is a great base, isn't it? Yeah. For the sort of All complexity of around yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so nice. So one of the best beers in the world. I mean, it's pretty good. I, 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 I think the rate beer thing is pretty nuts. Where you know, such a small influential set of people could totally change yeah. the scene. I mean, it kind um, of, it kind of slightly. In does it slightly annoy me? What's the word I'm trying to say? It, it's very interesting that when the story is told of West Wetter being the best beer in the world, it's like it's supposedly, you know, like it's this big website that voted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but like, it wasn't. It was, it was 150 beer geeks, probably in America. Yeah, and it, 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 <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of fetishized by a small community yeah. that kicked it into this wider scale. That have fetishized it because of the scarcity marketing, the fact that a couple of them, probably what happened yeah. was because I've interviewed quite a few of the original rate beer reviewers. Somebody went and got a case, brought it back to America and shared it with all of their rate beer friends. Um, so it would have been a very small subset of people that tried it and absolutely loved it and expected to absolutely love it. Yeah, And um, there's, there's something about when you get together with people, whatever your shared interest is, when you get together, yeah. you like 
sport ball or whatever, Johnny, you get you can get a little bit overexcited, right? Yeah. And it makes the experience of whatever it is you're drinking, eating, taking part in, watching better. Yeah. So and so you got to think that like you know like the yeast that went into this from West Mile, you know I probably prefer West Mile Triple over this, but West Mile Triple is in train stations and supermarkets and yeah. that kind of stuff. But I still think it's just as good a beer. So there's and that's kind of what's happened here. It's the rarity thing. It's it, it's better because you can't get it. So you want it more because you can't attain it. And I, I think possibly, and the reason I've used an aged one here is because it does age exceptionally well. That sherry, oaky yeah. kind of character that comes out is, it's almost like the, the definition of why we age beer because we want those two characteristics to come out and you get it in all the really great aging beers such as like Fuller's Vintage Ale, you get that oaky, almost tequila -y kind of edge to it. And so the fact that it ages really well makes it, a, the ratings will stay high. Nobody's having an old wrestle letter and going, oh, it's disgusting. But B, nobody is, people are considering it more refined because you can age it. I mean, I think it's a beautiful beer. I think the hype around it is, is extraordinary, but it shouldn't detract from how good the beer is. Um, and the incredible history that comes with it. You know, this is a 70-ish year old recipe. Um, now, again, brewed under the supervision of a couple of monks and presumably still rated extremely highly by about 150 beer geeks online, and indeed us. But I think this is better beer. Better beer, a beer I drink every day. I went cycling yeah. in that area. Beautiful everyday beer. Yeah. World class, best double I think in the world. And the second best quad I know. That's not bad. <laughs> it's not bad, is it? Come on, what a lineup there. Mm. What an incredible lineup of beers. So yeah, that's it for another of our, our Trappist series. The Holy Grail, this one, but that doesn't mean to say that the others aren't just as good at brewing. Um, but what a story, and one of the most unlikely stories you can think of. Just, just imagine being that monk, you know, early summer 2005, just having a quiet life, yeah. late summer 2005, <laughs> 100,000 phone calls a day. If anything would drive you to switching up your house beer for a 12, <laughs> I think that would. Cheers, guys.